Uh, hi everyone at home, welcome to another public open evening at uh, the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm here this week uh, with Joris Whitstock, who is a PhD student in the Kavli Institute for Cosmology. Um, he's going to be giving us a talk on the first galaxies in the universe, uh, so over to you Joris. All right, well thanks very much Matt. Um, yes, hello everyone, um, welcome. And um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. Um, so my name is uh, Joris Wittstock. Um, yeah, as Matt said, I'm a PhD student at the Kavli. And um, today I'll be talking to you about the first galaxies in the universe. Um, before we go into that though, um, just a, a quick few words about me. So I'm currently in the third year of my PhD um, and I've just got a little group photo um, here. So I'm being supervised by Roberto and Renska. Um, but then in this picture, you might also recognize Asha um, if you listened to the talk a few weeks ago. Um, and so before coming here, um, I was in the Netherlands, in Leiden, um, which is right here. Um, so quite close actually to Cambridge. Um, and, um, well, if you're ever around, um, I would highly, highly recommend visiting um, the old observatory um, that they have there. Um, it's a very beautiful um, uh, historical building um, with some still working telescopes. So, for example, this is a, an image of the moon that I took once uh, with my, my iPhone using the telescope in here. Um, but so today I'll be talking to you about galaxies and um, now I'm sure a lot of you have seen an image uh, of a nice uh, swirly galaxy uh, such as this beautiful one here. Um, so um, I think it's a, a, a good idea to first just ask the question, um, you know, what is a galaxy? How do we actually define um, what is a galaxy before, um, before we go on? Um, then I'll just spend a little bit on the question um, of actually why we do this kind of research. So why do we um, want to learn about the first galaxies in the universe? Um, then I'll talk to you um, about how we can actually do this in practice. Um, it turns out it's quite challenging. Um, but then I'll just show you some of the, the latest research in the field um, and a few examples from, from my work. But so first of all, let's talk about um, what a galaxy actually is. Um, and to do that, I'll start at a slightly smaller scale. So we'll start with a place that we're all very familiar with, um, and that's planet Earth. Um, and this is a, a beautiful image taken by one of the Apollo crews. Um, and of course, we all know this, this kind of um, nice picture from space. Um, of our planet. Um, but what is there beyond Earth? Well, um, we can, from Earth, um, start to look up at the sky um, and actually you can discover a lot of other astronomical objects. Um, and so anyone that would study these kind of objects we call an astronomer. That's the science of astronomy. Um, and I think the object um, we're all um, by far most familiar with although um, it doesn't appear very much in the UK winter, sadly. Uh, but this is actually the sun. And um, of course, we normally don't really think about this maybe as an astronomical object, but it, it really is. Um, it's our, um, the star that's closest to Earth um, and actually, uh, you know, enables life on Earth um, as we know it. Um, but so other than the sun, what else can we see? Well, the sun is actually so bright that during the day, there's not much um, you can see. So um, we therefore instead go to the night sky. And I've got this really beautiful picture here um, of the night sky. And um, of course, as you will know, um, you can see lots of stars around. Um, but I first want to talk about a very particular type of object. Um, and these are, um, yeah, some of the kind of special stars, if you want. And um, this was already known um, by 
um, the ancient Greek astronomers um, who called them wandering stars, um, or as you can see here, uh, planetes, which is where the word comes from. Um, and even earlier, um, we know the Babylonian astronomers already had a theory about planets 4,000 years ago. Um, but so why um, are they special? Well, they're wandering in the sense that um, against the, the background of stars, um, they actually move throughout the year. And um, this is actually a very special upcoming um, uh, special opportunity in terms of planetary motion. So um, in just under two weeks, um, Jupiter and Saturn will um, get very, very close together on the sky um, from, as we see it from Earth. Um, and so this explains why we call them wandering stars, because they really move across the sky. Um, and so I'm sure most of you have seen an overview kind of like this um, with all of the planets. Uh, so you can see a few here. So there's Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. Um, and if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see in the in the left um, part of your screen here, um, some tiny, tiny little dots. And well, you might wonder, you know, why did I choose this image? It doesn't really show the, the remaining planets, which are, are zoomed in on here. Uh, very well, but that that is kind of the point um, here, because the solar system um, is just almost impossible to to replicate um, to scale. So in this image, the distances are all to scale, um, but the actual sizes of the planet are the sizes of the planets aren't. So they're actually blown up by quite a bit to make it uh, to make you still um, able to see them. Um, and so to illustrate this a bit more, um, we can just take another scale model. So um, just imagining if we scale the sun down to the size of a, a tennis ball, um, then, well, you can have a guess um, how large Earth would be in that case. Um, and the answer is, um, I think, surprisingly, um, it's much less than a millimeter. So it's about the size probably of the tip of a suin pin. Um, what's even more striking though, is that the distance would be about seven meters between this tennis ball and the suin pin. So you can imagine the suin pin making its orbits around the tennis ball. Um, but then it gets even bigger when you, for example, imagine Pluto, which is um, you know, not even on this previous image because it's so far out. Um, Pluto can actually be up to 350 meters away on this scale. Um, so that's already um, quite hard to imagine. But then the solar system itself um, lives in this neighborhood of the sun, um, which we usually call the local, local interstellar cloud. Uh, so you can see an image of it, an artist's impression here. So it's this um, gas cloud. Um, and in the neighborhood, there's also a few other stars. So for example, we have uh, Proxima Centauri in the Alpha Centauri system. Um, and there's Sirius, for example. Um, so if we go back to our scale model, the tennis ball, um, and we imagine how far away these other stars would be, well, you can have another guess, but I think you'll probably underestimate it a little bit, at least I did, um, because on the scale where the sun is the size of a tennis ball, uh, Proxima Centauri would actually make it all the way to Morocco, just about in Africa, uh, while Sirius is all the way over here on the other side of the Atlantic. And so this kind of illustrates the, the sizes and the extent that we're talking about. So that's the sun and um, some of its local stars. Um, what else can we see in the, in the night sky then? Well, as I said earlier, um, most of these little white dots um, are all, all other stars. Um, most other stars will also be relatively close to the sun. Um, but then, as I'm sure you've noticed, there's also this 
um, band that stretches across the sky, this um, hazy white band. Um, and this um, we have also known for a very long time and um, it's been called different names, but we now refer to it as the Milky Way. Um, and the Milky Way, so again, um, named by the Greek uh, astronomers. And um, this is actually where our word for galaxy comes from. So the Milky Way is our galaxy, the galaxy of the sun. Um, and so what we refer to as a galaxy, uh, is just the collection of stars, but also um, the gas that's around the stars um, and some of the interstellar dust. And so here we have uh, yet another artist impression showing these very nice spiral arms. Um, so we know the Milky Way looks a little bit like this. Um, but of course, it's very hard to, we can only make an artist impression like this um, because we're actually in the Milky Way. So we can't see it from afar. So this is where the sun is um, at the middle um, of these circles here. And it's about eight kiloparsecs away from the um, galactic center. And um, at this point, you know, imagining these distances is almost impossible because if we think back about our scale model with the tennis ball, um, now the galactic center would be 12 million kilometers away on the scale model. Um, and so that's, you know, way beyond um, where the moon is. And that's just, yeah, um, I think uh, beyond our imagination almost to visualize how big that is. Um, and also um, this whole spiral structure actually rotates. So the whole galaxy uh, slowly rotates. Um, and I say slowly because it takes the sun uh, just over 200 million years to make it around uh, in one orbit. So that means the last time the sun was in the same position it's now in, um, you know, there were dinosaurs walking around on the earth. Um, so there's just completely different both distance and time scales involved um, if we consider galaxies. Um, but it turns out the Milky Way is not the only galaxy. And in fact, that's how we know how we think um, the Milky Way looks like, um, because we can see these other spiral nebulae if we look very, very closely um, at the night sky. Um, and spiral nebulae was just the term that we we used before we actually realized these are other galaxies. And so um, I'll show again this nice example with a very original name, of NGC 4414. Um, but also we know um, that there's actually many, many galaxies around. And so in fact, we know um, millions of them. And um, it turns out they come in all different sizes and shapes and the Milky Way is actually kind of a typical um, size and, and shape. And so the Milky Way we call a spiral galaxy. We can see um, shown in these three pictures here, there's also very different kind of shapes. So um, now that we know what a galaxy is, um, so it's the collection of stars and gas and dust, um, I'll go over to why we um, want to learn about the first galaxies in the universe. Um, and I'll go into both kind of a broader perspective as well as the, the scientific uh, motivation for this. Um, so, I mean, very broadly, why would we, why do we do astronomy? Um, well, I think astronomy, first of all, um, really goes into the very fundamental philosophical questions like where do we come from? Um, and that I think in its own right is already um, enough of a reason to study um, astronomical objects um, because humanity is just um, very curious and we always want to know why. Um, but I think as well, you know, facing the, the current global cha challenges like climate change, um, this gives us a very healthy perspective. Um, so in terms of climate change, um, I think realizing, you know, how unique Earth is and how much of a coincidence it is really that um, 
it's able to sustain life, I think um, we should be very careful to, um, yeah, to sustain that and, um, and be very careful with how we handle it um, as a species. Um, but anyway, if that's uh, not enough, well, there's also a lot of other very practical applications that are um, that come directly from astronomy. So think about your smartphone and its camera. Um, think about, for example, um, imaging techniques, medical imaging techniques, where we can um, find tumors in very early stages. Um, GPS systems rely on astronomy. Um, and also there's just a lot of general data analysis that benefits from all the um, technology that's developed as part of astronomical research. Um, so anyway, back to the, the scientific side. So why specifically do we um, want to learn about the first galaxies in the universe? Well, um, I'm showing you here this um, timeline of the universe. And I should say this is just a very schematic view um, of the, the timeline of the universe. So um, if we go over to the very right, this is the present day. So this is now, and you can see there's um, lots of different galaxies around. Um, the Milky Way might be one of these, um, these spiral galaxies. Um, over on the very left, we have the beginning of the universe. Um, and, you know, it, it couldn't have looked any different, uh, any more different. So this is what, um, we refer to as the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. Um, the Big Bang is mostly a theory about um, the universe moments, just tiny fractions of seconds um, after the universe uh, started to, to come into being. Um, and then we know it roughly evolved as is shown um, in the diagram here. And so on the top, you can see the um, different uh, moments in time. So Currently, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Um, and so this timeline is kind of skewed in a way um, because almost half of it, so this left half, um, is just showing the first billion years of the universe. But actually, in that time, a lot of things happened. And so um, right after the Big Bang, um, after the universe had cooled down um, and expanded a little bit, um, there was this event um, that we call recombination. Um, and at this moment, um, there was a release um, of light. And you can kind of see that as an afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, and this we call the, we now still observe this as the cosmic microwave background. And so we can actually see a signal from the universe when it is just about 400,000 years old, which is very, very young in terms of cosmological timescales. Then after that, um, we go to what we call the dark ages. Um, and that's a little bit misleading because it wasn't that there wasn't anything there or wasn't anything happening. Structure was actually forming. Um, it's just that um, the first stars and galaxies, so things that actually emit light that we can see, um, hadn't quite formed yet. So there's nothing um, we can directly observe from this period of the, of the universe. But then, as I mentioned, the first stars and galaxies started to form. Um, and this happens around um, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Um, so when we talk about observing um, the first galaxies. Um, this is what we can currently do. And so um, you'll see that we can't quite detect the, f the very first sources in the universe yet, um, but we're getting quite close and we can really see some of the youngest objects um, in the universe. Um, and I'll go into how we can actually see these objects directly in a bit. Um, but so um, I think there's two reasons why we want to know about these galaxies specifically. So first of all, this is just on its own a very interesting period to study. Um, you know, these are the very first sources and objects in the universe. Um, so I think that's reason enough to, 
to study them. But um, second of all, as I mentioned, so our only other observations are um, around here um, at the time of the CMB um, and in the local universe. And so the first galaxies can actually give us a very um, uh, nice bridge uh, in a way to um, explain the full evolution all the way from this moment um, to the present day and, um, and all the galaxies that we see um, currently. So with that um, idea in, our, in the back of our heads, then how do we actually go about this? Well, there's um, two uh, mechanisms that really help us out here. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly explain both of them. So the first one um, is the fact that we can actually look back in, in time. And um, to explain how that works, I'll um, just do uh, a little bit of a thought experiment. So think about lightning. Um, we've all seen lightning in the distance. So when you see lightning, it always takes a while for the sound to actually arrive. So before you can hear the thunder. And that's because sound is a wave, um, a wave through the air. And the speed of sound um, is about 1,200 kilometers an hour, which is very fast. So normally, in a conversation, you would always think that the sound um, of another person uh, reaches you instantly. But if you see lightning, say, 10 kilometers away, um, it will actually take the sound about 30 seconds to reach you. Um, but this actually also goes for the light. So also seeing the lightning takes a finite amount of time. Now, the difference is that light is much, much quicker than sound. And so the speed of light, um, which we usually denote as C, which is the C in MC squared, for example, is about 300,000 kilometers, and not per hour, but per second. And so that means um, at 10 kilometers away, the light will take about 0 0.033 milliseconds to reach us, which is almost instantly still. But if we start to look at astronomical objects with the distances involved there, um, we actually start to see a delay as well, like the thunder. And so for the sun, for example, um, that takes about eight minutes for the light to reach us. Um, if we again go to the um, nearby star, the, the closest star, um, the star is about 4.25 light years away, which just means that the light takes 4.25 years to reach us. And this is why we usually work with units of light years. And um, if you take, for example, the closest galaxy, which is Andromeda, um, this takes about two and a half million years for its light um, to reach us um, because it's about two and a half million light years away. Um, now, the second mechanism is the expansion of the universe. And um, this is really a, a quite a tricky concept um, to get your head around. And so I'm going to try to give you an analogy uh, again. And I'm sure many of you over the pandemic have uh, given baking a try. And so my analogy in this case will be bread with resins in it. And so if you imagine making some dough with resins in it um, and letting that um, dough rise, uh, you might um, be able to see that um, as the dough starts to rise, the distance between the individual resins starts to increase. And that's exactly or um, pretty much how um, the expansion of the universe works for galaxies as well. And so if you imagine that, for example, the middle resin here is, is the Milky Way, and these might be other galaxies far away, um, you'll see that the distance between the Milky Way, so us, and other galaxies increases over time. And this means that from our perspective, um, these galaxies seem to move away from us. And 
And this is exactly the point because everything that moves away from you um, will be red shifted in color. And so this means that blue colors will slowly be shifted towards the red. Um, and this is exactly the same mechanism um, that causes, for example, if an ambulance drives by, um, you hear the frequency changing as it uh, moves towards you versus when it moves away from you. Um, there, the, the sound waves are actually um, shifted because of the speed of the vehicle. Um, but this can also happen with light. And so an actual image can show different colors depending on how quickly um, either an object is moving um, relative to you, or if you start to look at objects that are far away enough, um, this is actually caused naturally by the expansion of the universe. So without anything moving at all. Um, and about 90 years ago, um, exactly this mechanism was what Hubble used to show. So this is going the other way around. Um, his measurements of redshifted galaxies, he was able to prove that the universe was expanding. Um, so now I'll just quickly go into um, some current research. So the very um, uh, latest um, results and also a few examples of my own work. So first of all, I'll show you um, the very, very most distant galaxy that we know at the moment. Um, and I won't go into the full details of this uh, figure here on the, on the right because that would take a little bit of time to explain. Um, but you can just appreciate um, that this is the kind of measurement that um, we usually um, have to deal with. And well, you actually see the galaxy. Well, um, right in the middle of these crosshairs of these two images on the right here, you can see a little dot here and a slightly bigger dot here. And so these are actually detections of this um, very, very distant galaxy. And this galaxy has a redshift uh, of 11. And so redshift is just uh, how we typically measure the distance to, the, to these objects. Um, and that redshift of 11 um, might not mean much on its own. Um, but this, um, this number here, if you add one to it, that will be um, what that will tell you um, that, so in this case, um, the light from this object, when it was emitted, um, the universe was about 12 times um, smaller than it is now. So 12 times more compact, which is a huge factor if you think about it. If you think about taking a certain distance and you know squeezing it together by a factor of 12. Um, and also it was emitted when the universe was only 3% of its current age. Um, so this really shows this is one of the first objects, one of the first galaxies in the universe. Um, so that's kind of the high redshift frontier. Um, and now I'll just quickly show you some of um, some examples of my work. So in my research, um, I use a, a combination both of computer simulations. So this image on the right, for example, is a big simulation of a, a, a portion of the universe, um, as well as observations. So images um, like these uh, of very distant galaxies. Um, where we try to learn um, what the properties of these galaxies are. And so one thing, for example, that we're looking at um, is how the stars in the galaxy, in a galaxy, you know, very far away from us is influencing its surroundings. So the surroundings, I mean, um, the gas around the galaxy, for example. Um, and the way it can do that is, um, in our case, we're looking at um, ultraviolet light. And well, if you know that if you get a sunburn, you know, from our own star, the sun, um, you'll, um, you'll appreciate that if you get a sunburn, and this is caused by ultraviolet light, 
um, this UV light, as we call it, is actually very energetic and it's able to really damage your cells in your body. Um, but so in the same way, we know that um, stars in these very young galaxies, very early on in the universe, um, were actually emitting a lot more UV light than, for example, our sun. Um, and so you can, and you can see how that um, might have a really big impact on the surrounding um, medium. And to explain that just a little bit more, uh, I think we have a little bit of time. So um, this is all in the context of um, this period of the universe right here. So um, you'll see that from the dark ages over here, it says neutral um, to over on the right here, it says fully ionized. This uh, refers to the state of um, all the gas in the universe. Um, so actually most of the, the matter that we can see um, is not contained in stars or in galaxies, but rather in gas, mostly surrounding these galaxies. And so before any of the, the stars, the first stars and galaxies started to form, um, this gas was neutral. And so it's, uh, it's really a gas. But then as the first objects started to form, they started to ionize um, the universe, which just means um, they converted the neutral gas to a plasma. And so a plasma is where um, all the atoms lose their electrons and they become free electrons. And um, we're trying to figure out, uh, for example, if um, these first objects, what in them, so was it the stars or possibly other um, objects, what caused this, um, this huge change um, that we know and can see is there in the very early universe. Um, and so I'll just quickly illustrate um, some measurements here. So what you're seeing, all these, all these colored lines are um, detections of emission lines um, in this galaxy on the left here. And so uh, emission lines are just um, light at a very specific wavelength. Um, so it's at a very specific color. And um, by looking at these different emission lines, we can actually, um, we can link them to certain atoms and even tell how much these atoms are ionized. So for example, this one is called carbon four, which means it comes from carbon, but carbon when it's ionized three times and helium two means helium, but once ionized. Um, and I won't go into the full details, but um, with these measurements, and so by just looking at which types of lines and therefore which kind of atomic species see, um, we can start to distinguish if it's, for example, stars um, shown by the lines here in this diagram, um, or rather other objects um, that we call AGN um, that cause um, these lines to be visible to us. And um, well, and I won't have time to talk about this. Um, that could be a whole lecture on its own, but an AGN um, is an active galactic nucleus, and that's just a black hole in the center of one of these galaxies um, that's influence, influencing um, the galaxy. That's, so that's why I put this little picture, this image of the black hole here that you might uh, remember from last year. Um, so I think that's probably uh, coming up to the, the time I have. So I'll just finish uh, here by showing you um, some of the, the upcoming, so the future experiments that will be um, working towards um, enabling us to actually see uh, up to the very, very first objects, so the first galaxies in the universe. Um, and so you see in the images here, um, all these telescopes look quite different. And that's just because they're all focusing on very specific wavelengths. So very specific colors in the spectrum of light, um, mostly beyond the spectrum that we can see, so the visible. Um, and I'll point out here, this telescope is called the James Webb, um, 
which is um, hopefully going to be launched next year, um, which is very exciting. This is kind of the uh, successor to the Hubble telescope um, in some ways. So lots of um, very exciting um, new experiments to look forward to. And um, I'll end on that and I'll answer any questions you might have. So thank you very much. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Joris, for that fascinating talk. Um, uh, like I said at the start, um, any questions that you, may, you have for Joris, pop them in the YouTube chat. Uh, I'm going to kick off with this one that's come through from Nandita, um, who wants you to talk a little bit more about your computer simulations. Mm. Um, she asks, what techniques do you use for your simulations? Uh, can you talk a little bit about maybe the language and the software and the type of analysis that you do with one of your simulations? Right. So um, I'll just pull up the picture again because it's uh, it's very pretty to look at, I think. Um, so I, I should say that um, by working on simulations, I actually work mostly on the analysis. So I'm, I'm not really designing the simulations myself per se. Um, but so the way this um, is usually set up, um, well, there's different techniques of simulations. Um, usually we... Um, divide um, all the things that you want to simulate. So for example, um, the stars, but also the gas, we divide them up into very um, small cells or particles. And so each of those cells might contain, um, say a million um, solar masses. So a million times the mass of the sun. Um, and, um, once you have those, those cells set up, uh, you can start to implement the, the laws of physics. So gravity, um, thermodynamics, um, of course, we also take into account the expansion of the universe. So there's a, a cosmological, we call it a cosmological background. Um, and all of this combined, we then try to solve. Um, and so these simulations nowadays, um, are, you know, you wouldn't be able to run this on any standard laptop or, or computer. So we, uh, we actually run these on supercomputers and they take, um, you know, days or weeks, months, sometimes, uh, depending on how big your simulation is to, to run. Um, and so this is really, um, yeah, almost, um, you know, this is really supercomputing and almost starting to become a different uh, branch of astronomy. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, a slightly head spinning question has come in from Julia. Um, do your best with it. Um, she wants to know how far will the universe expand during an average human lifetime? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I would have to think about that. Um, I, I do um, just, you know, estimating off the top of my head. Um, if you consider the fraction of, you know, the time that a human uh, life, so maybe uh, 80, 90 years, um, is compared to the typical time scales that we're talking about. Um, so millions or even billions of years over the lifetime of the universe. Um, that fraction is just so small that I think um, it would probably be very, very small, um, but still there. And the universe is expanding as we, as we speak. Right, and if you if you look at the speed that the universe is expanding, right, it's it's pretty fast by human uh, human timescales. If we look at some nearby galaxies, they might be flying away from us because of the expansion of the, of the universe at hundreds of kilometers per second. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's right. So the we have this very um, specific constant, um, a very famous constant, which is also called the Hubble constant after, you know, the discovery of Hubble. And um, this constant is about 70 kilometers per second. And that's per megaparsec that an object is away. So this rule just tells you that if a, a galaxy is um, one megaparsec away, which means a million parsecs, um, which is an extremely large distance. Um, but if you take one megaparsec, 
um, an object on average will seem to be moving at about 70 kilometers per second away from us. So that's, uh, that's the scale. Okay, uh, one, uh, so lots of people coming through saying thank you very much. Uh, one final question from Mania, um, who, <laughs> again, we're getting all the big questions tonight. Uh, she's wondering if there's only one Big Bang or have there been many Big Bangs? Oh, that, well, that's again, yeah, very, um, yeah, almost philosophical question. Um, so our most scientific theories, well, I think the, the answer to the question is we don't know per se. Um, we might be able to, to establish this in the future, but um, our current understanding as it is um, stretches from say the present moment uh, and it goes back to very early on. Um, so we can quite accurately describe the universe, um, but only un up until um, a very small fraction of time after the Big Bang. So most theories actually uh, don't really go into what happened exactly at the moment of the Big Bang, uh, but then we can start to say something um, about the moment right after. Um, but so the actual Big Bang, I think, is, is still quite a big mystery to us. Um, and so the fact of whether there's one or maybe multiple um, maybe ties into you know, the question if there's one universe or perhaps parallel universes. Um, I think we just don't know at this moment. Wonderful. I think that's quite a good place to finish. Uh, so thank you, uh, Joris, for such a fascinating talk. Thank you to everyone at home uh, who has been watching and asking questions. Uh, next week, we have Robin Catchpole, who will, will be giving us our last public talk of 2020. Um, so, yes, yeah, sorry for the, uh, for, for the clouds and the lack of observing. Fingers crossed uh, for next week. And yes, see you guys next week. Thanks. See you. And we have ended.